Welcome to the next installment of our uh, pa uh, Policy Challenges During a Pandemic webinar series. Uh, today, we are very happy to have with us Adam Defala, who is actually going to be teaching in the MPP program this summer, and he's teaching a course on rhetoric and communications. Um, Adam is a senior managing director in a company called Tenio, or Tenio, I'm not quite sure how it's no. pronounced, which is a CEO advisory firm. Before that, he was with Hatley Strategy Advisors. Before that, he practiced law in Montreal. And before that, he's probably done some other things that he might actually talk about today. So today, he is going to talk about communications uh, during this pandemic. You'll notice the title, The Good, The Ugly, and The Ugly. This is not a typo, but I will leave it to Adam to explain what's going on. Glad to be here. And I, I want to preface my remarks by saying, uh, like you all, I'm at home working and we have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, two boys, and they're both in the house. So there may be uh, at any moment an interruption from them <laughs> coming in screaming. So if I, I want to preempt the apology on that if we do get interrupted. I'm sure many people are dealing with the same sorts of issues as they work from home. Uh, the second thing I want to say is, again, this is not uh, rocket science, but this situation that we're, that we're living in is one that's evolving minute by minute. So it's very difficult to um, put anything uh, down with any sort of certainty or um, the feeling of, of being official because protocols are changing by the day. Um, the situation is changing by the minute. So my thoughts are, are very rough at this point. And because we're all just drinking from a fire hose, observing what's going on in our own lives and around us, uh, it's very difficult to boil it down into something coherent and cohesive. I've done my best, but um, I want to just preempt my comments by saying that we may be revisiting or I may be pulling back some of these comments at a later date. But these are just some of the thoughts and, and observations I have from the first month of this, uh, from what I've been watching and seeing, and also some thoughts from the work that I've been doing and uh, observing in my daily life at, at Teneo, which is our, our advisory firm, uh, and I work in the strategic communications group. So I've divided this into sort of two sections, and I do want to leave as much time as we can towards the end of this for an interactive talk, because I think this topic really lends itself well to uh, a back and forth discussion. But I've created a presentation that's really um, two parts. The first is about the theoretical aspects of communications during a crisis and how that's supposed to work, at least by the book, according to best practices. And the second part is more about what we're observing in real time and what some of my um, observations are uh, on what we're seeing real in real time live and also where I think things are gonna go next because we're in uncharted territory as we all know and um, it's a situation in flux. So I'll start out by just um, talking a bit about the COVID situation. Um, obviously this is a very unique and novel uh, crisis and uh, governments, businesses, and all organizations are moving at breakneck speed to try to deal with it. And um, there's, a not a lot, there's not a lot of uh, templates and, and, and plans that were uh, in place ahead of time to be able to deal with a global pandemic. Uh, we're seeing videos, I'm sure some of you have seen these come out, that have shown uh, certain individuals, Bill Gates and others, who'd been warming up, warning about planning for a pandemic for years, but a lot of people didn't take that advice to heart. And I think what we're seeing with um, the responses of some governments around the world is the lack of preparation that existed uh, for a crisis of this magnitude. So this chart uh, that I've put up here um, is, is showing sort of how we see the the trajectory of the crisis. So day one, uh, life as we knew it in the past tense, outbreaks in communities, then national response, then there's a mass outbreak and we're sort of where we are um, today at the very bottom of this V shape. 
uh, if you see at the bottom, we're at this, we're still in the global crisis stage and we're sort of now, I think just at least in the West, we're just tipping up to the start of the right hand of the V with cases declining because a lot of jurisdictions in the West are now hitting that peak and we should start seeing uh, cases decline. Uh, and very soon, hopefully in the next few days and weeks, we're going to be on the resolution and recovery side of this, of this graph and heading towards uh, the new normal that we'll be living in uh, once this is under control. And we still don't fully know or grasp what that new normal is going to look like. Uh, this chart um, also is about uh, how the recovery will, will look. Um, organizations are planning the recovery at this point. They've, they've moved from uh, containment and, and dealing with the crisis itself, in many cases, to looking towards how we get out of this uh, and prepare for the future. And um, I think that this sort of shows the lineage of how this is going to work. So the cases will decline, uh, communities will start demonstrating health, so uh, quarantines will be lifted, businesses will be allowed to reopen. We're already seeing this in some Western European countries. I don't know if um, you're following Europe, but countries like Austria, Denmark, um, the German example is, is similar to Canada and in Quebec, where I follow things most closely. Uh, and those jurisdictions are looking at a gradual phase out of the quarantine. For example, in, in Quebec, uh, just this week, there were three specific sectors that were allowed to reopen. One was um, construction sites, uh, residential construction and commercial construction. Uh, another one was, um, was garden centers and horticultural um, uh, commerce. And uh, I can't remember what the third one was now, but there were three. So we're gonna see gradual reopening sector by sector, I think, as we get back to being open for business. And um, after that, we'll have non-essential type businesses getting back to work. And then uh, we'll have our new normal, which is still, as I said, being defined. And social, social distancing is going to obviously continue being a part of that. Um, so this is a sort of a basic um, template here of how um, leadership during a crisis should work or is supposed to work. And I think what we're seeing throughout this in the last month or so is how different leaders are dealing with the COVID crisis from uh, a different different perspectives depending on their personality and how they handle stress and situations and inevitably some people rise to the top and show that they're really in their element in these types of situations whereas others um, really show that that's not the type of person that they are and that's not the kind of situation that they're made from. That's sort of why I called the presentation the good, the ugly, and the ugly because there really aren't any middle ground cases that I've seen so far in terms of how different government leaders and agencies are dealing with this from a communications perspective. Uh, there has really only been great and, and quite bad. There has not really been much in between and uh, great has not been uh, a common one. Most are having a very difficult time with this and I'll talk a bit about why I think that is later. But I think the most important trait of any leader in a crisis like this, uh, especially when it comes to communications, is to demonstrate leadership. We're in an uncertain period, and it's a level of uncertainty that most of us, in fact, all of us, uh, have never seen. Because those who were around during the last pandemic, SARS was obviously one, and that was in 2003. But the, the last real global pandemic, you'd have to go back to the Spanish flu, which was 1919. And there's very few people that are alive today who were alive in 1919. People want to understand and people want to be comforted. And there's a great um, level of emotion involved in this whole situation. Uh, people want to be comforted emotionally and they want to know that people are in charge, that know what they're doing. And a lot of leaders have failed to do that in their communications. 
And I understand why, uh, because of the uncertainty and not really knowing how to deal with this. Uh, but people want to feel like someone is in charge and is, is, able to, is able to guide us down the right path. I think to exacerbate this point number one, um, demonstrating leadership, why it's been so difficult, is we live in a society today that is replete with choices. We have so much choice in our lives in 2020 from everything we do, our choice of work, our choice of leisure activities, uh, what media we consume and don't consume. There are so many options available to us every day in our lives, food, everything. And this situation has forced everyone to do the same thing, which is to say stay home and, and not have a lot of contact with outside individuals. And to go from a society that is so dependent and so used to having so much choice to not having any at all is a lot for people to absorb. And I think that's one of the reasons that people are yearning for, for leadership because they want to know where this is all heading and they want to know it with a level of certainty. And I think leaders are having a difficult time finding the answers to that and communicating that type of message. Um, point two is rebuild and maintain trust. So uh, leaders must maintain trust and credibility with voters, the civil service, other stakeholders around them. As I said, this is proving to be a real difficult challenge for a lot of leaders because they can't really say more than what they know and they don't know a lot. And there's also been a lot of different responses to this jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So there's a lot of comparison going on between different levels of government and different uh, provinces, states and countries. So it's been difficult for them to build trust and, and maintain trust. And a lot of them are gonna have rebuilding to do once this is settled down. I don't wanna use the term when this is over. When, when this is settled down and um, we can look a bit more into the future with a level of certainty. And the third role of a leader in a crisis is to recognize opportunities. So leaders must transform organizations to address the factors that contributed to the crisis and use the crisis as an opportunity to better position the organization to accomplish long-term goals. I think this is gonna be one of the most difficult and highly scrutinized aspect of the COVID crisis. That is to say, where are we going next and uh, what can we do to make sure that in the future, these same types of mistakes that we've seen at the outset of this are not, are not repeated. Uh, this is just a very brief slide on, on crisis communications and how to prepare for them. So the main, the main thing is, it's not rocket science, the main thing is to be prepared, um, to have plans in place, um, to make sure that you have a group of people that are charged with handling communications during a crisis and to make sure that everybody has defined roles and everyone knows what they have to do and uh, the chain of command. So one of the mistakes that people often make uh, during crisis situations is uh, nobody really wants to take full accountability for different things. And the most important thing in a crisis situation is for everybody who's involved in managing it to know exactly who does what and when and who is responsible for it. Where does the buck stop? If you don't have someone, one individual, who is directly responsible for each bucket or each aspect of managing the crisis, then something is inevitably going to slip through the cracks. That's the first problem with it. And the second problem is something is going to happen that either shouldn't have or something that should get done is not going to get done because nobody will be understanding who the final authority is and uh, it just takes a lot longer and one of the most important aspects of managing a crisis is to act with rapidity uh, it's urgent it's urgent to act quickly and without proper protocols in place and uh, chains of command in place and a plan in place then all these things get slowed down and the response is too slow. So being prepared is the most important part. Um, second thing is active response. So making sure that you're addressing the situation, making sure that you're communicating constantly, uh, making sure that reputations are being protected, that you have the right information 
Information is key and communicating correct information, not speculating. That's a very tough one in the current situation because there are so many uncertainties coupled with the fact that there's so many people asking for answers to so many different questions and not having those answers. It's very difficult to stay to script and to only talk about what we know. And um, I've seen a couple of examples at least where governments have gotten a little bit ahead of themselves. I'll give you an example in Quebec, which is the area that I follow the most closely. Um, François Legault, the premier, last week speculated that schools may open before the end of the imposed uh, social distancing regime, which is set to expire on May the 4th, unless it's extended. And he immediately had to backtrack on that. He's, he said uh, the next day in his press conference that they were looking at all kinds of scenarios and that schools could be reopened before May 3rd or 4th at that date or after, and that nothing would be done without the approval and sanction of the public health authorities. So it's um, tempting, I think is the word, for communicators and leaders in a situation like this to speculate and talk about different scenarios for the future with some level of detail, but uh, it's important during a crisis to not do that because you may inadvertently get people's hopes up. Uh, it's important to stick to script and to only talk about the facts that are known and things that have certitude or else you end up um, probably having to backtrack, which is very damaging and difficult and erodes trust. Uh, third step after the active response is, is rebuilding. Uh, so that's when things start um, getting to the second side of that V, um, having to um, uh, rebuild our reputation and rebuild uh, trust and making sure that people are more comfortable with uh, where we're going next and having a level of understanding and, and certitude about where we're heading next. And I think we're sort of in the uh, end of the second phase here and we're starting to move into the third phase of rebuilding in the next few days. Uh, this is, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but this is just a basic um, chart uh, that we use uh, through in our work with how you uh, set up a crisis communications uh, cell. So you have your war room, which as I said earlier has to be composed of people with very clearly delineated responsibilities and jobs. Um, uh, you've got um, everybody uh, in one place. It's difficult, obviously, in the circumstances because most people are working remotely. So at least um, virtually in the same place and communicating constantly. Um, there has to be a recognition within the organization that any major decision or anything to do with the crisis goes through this particular group. Uh, so you have a core, a core team um, and uh, everything goes up to the top, which is the people that communicate things to the public. Uh, so the heads of state, so in, in Quebec, for example, you've got Francois Legault, uh, who does the daily press conference with the health minister, Danielle McCann, and the chief medical officer of health in Toronto with Doug Ford in Ontario, they're doing the same thing. Trudeau in Ottawa is always accompanied by Dr. Tam. Uh, they're the ones that communicate what the war room comes up with and uh, states to the public. So th those are just sort of theoretical aspects of crisis communications. Now I, I wanna spend the rest of the time really just talking about the situation at hand and more precisely what uh, what we're, what we're seeing day to day. So the, the, the difficult part of this is, as I said, the uncertainty around it because we don't have a playbook for COVID. Um, and I've started referring to this as the HML phenomenon. How much longer? Everybody wants to know what are the timelines for getting out of this? And it would be so much easier for all of us to be able to deal with this situation if we did have a bit more certainty on what the timelines are and how much longer we have to deal with this type of isolation. And very few leaders are talking about that. And from a crisis communications perspective, that's probably smart because many just don't know the answer. And as I said, it's very 
poor practice to speculate. But everybody wants to know what the future looks like. And they're all reluctant to do that because they want to err on the side of caution. You can get one thing uh, for sure, which is one thing is that no leader, whether it's provincial premiers or the president of the United States or anybody, wants to be on the wrong side of history on this event. Uh, and no matter what their actions are, uh, they want to make sure that they're erring on the side of safety and caution. So the likelihood that we'll get out of this uh, earlier rather than later is very small. I think elected officials are going to be wanting to be seen to be extra cautious and extra protective. So communicating the future and how the getting out of this looks has been very missing from the public discourse. And I think that's on purpose. Um, scenario planning is still going on. And I think most governments and most leaders and most civil servants are looking at different scenarios, sort of a depending on whether X, Y, Z happens, we can do this, this, or this. I think that's what most of them are looking at, sort of a um, uh, better than expected, as expected, or worse than expected type scenarios, and very difficult to communicate that. Um, the second thing is, I call it practicing what you preach on COVID. So um, the the leaders that we're seeing on TV every day are sometimes not living up to the standards that they're expecting of us. And I put Trudeau at Harrington Lake here as an example. I don't know if you saw this, but um, over the weekend, last weekend, uh, the Prime Minister and his family crossed the Ontario border into Quebec and went to the, the, the Prime Ministerial Cottage at Harrington Lake. And uh, there were pictures circulating on social media of this. And meanwhile, uh, you were told not to cross provincial borders. And I don't know about other provinces or, or countries, but in Quebec, at least, we were being told not to go into other regions. People were told you can't go from Montreal to the Laurentians, or you can't go from Montreal to uh, the Eastern townships. So when Trudeau was photographed, um, going to his cottage, I think a lot of people got ticked off at that because they also wanted to go to their cottage. That's a communications failure because it demonstrates a lack of sensitivity for what everyday people are going through and also a certain hypocrisy. Um, another example of this is Donald Trump. You know, we're talking about the importance of social distancing and um, Donald Trump has been uh, photographed and, and on video on the on the dais when he's doing his social um, when he's doing his um, daily press conferences where he's touching and, and shaking hands and being very close to all kinds of other individuals so these mixed messages are never good from a communications perspective because they open you up to criticism and in the era of social media um, that type of criticism and 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 sort of gotcha type thing has gotten to be very common and much more pronounced. And uh, because they're on the internet, they last forever. So very damaging from a reputational perspective to be seen as contradicting your own directives. And I've seen that a few times during the crisis. Um, next, I wanted to say a little bit about, um, I said this a little bit earlier on the first point, but there's just a lack of clarity about where we go from here. Um, and one person who I think has done a good job at this is um, the California governor, Gavin Newsom, who published a list of six principles that will need to be met before uh, normal life can start resuming again. Uh, he's one of the first that have done that. And since he did that, I've seen a couple of others. Um, I think in Ontario, um, Doug Ford has put out a similar a similar different phases list and what he expects in each one. Anyway, those that are those that are doing that kind of hypothetical or theoretical at least planning for what the road ahead is, I think are a step of ahead of others that are not doing that sort of um, principles based approach. I think that this principles based approach is better than than nothing when you can't propose or communicate anything that's concrete because this at least gives people a framework 
of what they can expect things to look like in the future. So it's a way of giving some certainty and some predictability to folks without saying anything too concrete. Uh, another point is um, policies that have been developed over the last two weeks, let's say. The worst policies are made during times of crisis. That's a common saying, and I think we're seeing an example of that right now. Um, there's many, many different policies that have been thrown around and uh, responses to this have been changing by the day. Uh, especially at the federal level in Canada, the, the policies that have been proposed and enacted have even been amended subsequent to that. For example, the uh, wage subsidy program that was developed uh, was amended uh, a, a week or so after it was originally proposed, where they had um, said that uh, the government would subsidize wages 10 or 15 percent, I think, and then last week they announced that it would actually be 75 percent. And there's a very complicated formula that you have to follow to calculate whether or not your business is uh, capable of being eligible for this wage subsidy. Um, a, little, a little bit ham-handed, I think, the way that it was handled. But again, we're composing in unknown, unknown territory. So it's very difficult. Another one, and I have direct anecdotal evidence of this, is the, the CERB the emergency response benefit, which those of you that are following know that the government very quickly, I think it was the first policy announcement they did, uh, announced that everyone who was being laid off temporarily uh, could get this $2,000 a month uh, CERB uh, as sort of a top up or a, a bonification to the employment insurance program in Canada. And that's been very well received, but as I was told by a business owner, um, a lot of people that worked for this person, uh, they don't make $2,000 a month because they're either working part time or they have a low hourly wage and they supplement with tips. So a lot of people can actually make more money on the serve than they would working their job. And Canadians can qualify and get the CERB uh, at least until June. So this particular person was worried that um, a lot of staff may not come back uh, to the job if if he reopens because they can make more money getting this benefit. Um, so again, nothing is going to be perfect in a crisis situation, but that's an example of one that may not have been thought through to the end uh, and was was uh, done in the midst of the crisis to obviously um, give some support to people very quickly. And it probably wasn't uh, stress tested in the way that it should have been before it was announced. Um, Trump's line is the cure worse than the disease. I, I hate to quote Trump on that, but I think if this continues a lot longer, a lot more people are going to start asking these questions. We've all seen some of the articles on the internet saying 99% of the people affected or who have died are over a certain age or had pre-consisting conditions. Or I think if, if the economic total keeps mounting in the way that it is, a lot more people are going to start asking themselves questions about the response to this and whether or not it was the right one. And that's going to create a huge communications challenge for government leaders all over the world. Um, I, I don't know where that one is heading, but um, I think if things continue for a lot longer, and let's be very honest with each other, we, we haven't really seen the real impacts of this yet, nor have we seen even an iota of what could happen if things go really badly. I'm talking about things like social unrest and we, we, we aren't there yet uh, and hopefully we never will get there. But if we ever start getting near that type of situation, you're gonna have a lot more people asking if this was the right response and if, if the situation warranted the um, the, the difficulties that we've put ourselves through. Um, the other, th the next thing I wanted to talk about was just where we're, where we're going and what some of the things that I foresee happening are, uh, following this. Um, I just think that we're going to see an exacerbation of some of the trends in politics that we've seen developing over the past five years or so, or 10 years, which is to say, 
a lot more questioning of globalization. Um, we're going to see uh, a lot of people questioning why critical supplies are not made locally, and I think that it will be made more locally in the future. Um, we've already seen this deglobalization trend uh, happening uh, really since the pre pre 2008 uh, period. We've never recovered uh, to the level that we used to have uh, in terms of global trade and globalization. But the factors of blue collar unemployment, which is going to be very bad, I think, coming out of this, um, and and the lack of trade and just the cutbacks that we're going to see and the levels of unemployment we're going to see are going to force uh, government to massively intervene in the economy for quite some time going forward. And uh, this is going to have a political impact uh, that could be absolutely gigantic. We, we still don't know, and it's still very speculative, but it's going to be very difficult, I think, for governments to get a handle on the proper policy response to what's going to come out of this, because we're just in phase one of a problem that's going to have many different phases, in my opinion. Uh, and then just to end, I, I wanted to talk about some of my just high level observations about um, what I've been witnessing uh, from a communications perspective and what I think some of the lessons are that we can already take away from what we've seen, even though we're just about a month into this. I think the biggest one um, is that the ham-handed response of a lot of public bodies is showing us that crisis communication planning was not what it ought to have been. Uh, either that it lacked the necessary detail that it should have, or worst case scenarios were not looked at as seriously as they should have. Um, and I think this is going to force organizations everywhere, not just governments, but businesses, nonprofits, everyone, schools, to do much more in-depth and more detailed crisis planning going forward. Um, nobody had properly planned for this. It's clear as day. Anybody living through it, watching it closely can tell. So um, that's lesson number one is crisis communication planning and just crisis planning writ large is going to take a much more predominant role, I think, in the lives of organizations and they're going to get a lot more attention going forward. My second observation is on um, the level of scrutiny and slack that we're, that we're cutting our leaders. Um, governments have been sort of given a pass in the last few weeks because we all know that we're dealing with an unchartered situation, uncharted territory and a brand new situation and that this is novel. And I think we've given them a fair bit of deference as they act to quickly deal with this. But the second phase, which is starting now, really, uh, is going to be much more difficult for them. And there's going to be a lot more scrutiny than the first because of various reasons. I think A, people are gonna be paying a lot more attention to how they do it. B, I think there's going to be great divergences from jurisdiction to jurisdiction on how the response works. I think that uh, people are going to be questioning their place of, of, of living when they see that another place is doing things a totally different way. And they're gonna be asking hard questions about why we're not doing what so-and-so is doing. So there's going to be a lot more, um, a lot less forgiveness, I think, on the second phase of this. That is to say, the stabilization phase and then the return to the new, the new normal uh, after this. And that's gonna be very difficult for governments to deal with and especially um, how they communicate it is going to be looked at very closely. So that's gonna be a real challenge for, everybody going forward uh, who are in positions of authority. Um, and my last point is um, the need for airtight protocols. So I think um, the first point that I made, or one of the first points that I made is that you have to have your crisis cell very well organized with clear buck stops here, um, 
outlines for each person in a position of authority. And I think that's become even more important uh, through this crisis because it's very, very obvious now that you just can't predict anything that's going to happen one day after the next. And if you don't have the right people in place ahead of time, uh, there's going to be chaos in dealing with these unpredictable situations. And that leads to an inevitably slow response to something which makes you look very bad. So uh, protocols and who's doing what within a crisis cell are going to be very much more important than they ever were. They always were important, but we're just in a situation now where there is no playbook and there is no example that we can really look to in the past. And uh, with the unpredictability of this, I think uh, we've seen that being well organized and having a tight cell uh, are, are very, very, very important and need to be outlined in advance. So those are my very rough thoughts uh, from what we're seeing in a situation that's evolving by the minute and the hour in the day. And um, I think overall, um, this, this thing is hopefully going to have some silver linings to it um, in the sense that uh, not really from a communications perspective, but I think people are just going to come out of this thinking that and feeling more grateful, I guess, is the term I want to use, more grateful for what we have and, and realizing the importance of home and family. I think in my own case, it's been nice to spend a lot more time with my kids and my wife, um, which I've actually enjoyed a lot. But uh, there's going to be a lot of questioning of, of the way we work, the way governments work, and the way a lot of things in society function going forward. And I think we're heading into that phase now where we're going to start really putting meat on the bones on some of those questions. And it's hard to kind of take yourself out of the, the present because we're living in such an awkward moment. But I think a lot of that discussion and debate is going to be fascinating in the coming months and looking forward to seeing where it all, where it all leads.